Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and the time has come once more to dive back into Total War Warhammer 3. I'll be releasing a handful of videos either over the next few days or all together right now, or perhaps over the last few days, but either way, I'll have a handy playlist linked in the description and pinned comment down below, so you can see everything from the rosters in this video, the new battle modes in another, and more. A massive thanks to the folks over at Creative Assembly that not only deemed me worthy of this opportunity to showcase Warhammer 3, but fought through Nurgle's attempts at disruption to make this event happen. Just as a heads up, you'll hear the occasional Windows system sound or Discord notification sound for which I apologize. They weren't in my control, but that's the nature of the beast in these times. Besides, everything you're about to see is so dope I doubt you'll even notice, and if you decide to grab the game after you see said dopeness, doing so at the link in the description and pinned comment down below helps support the channel. Opening spiel out of the way, let's dive in. Right off the bat, I just want to throw all the stat cards on screen here for you so you know what's coming. There's some very exciting stuff to look at, and new icons and abilities and stats to interpret, and you can use the timestamps in the description down below to navigate through the various units and characters we're looking at. Please note that these are confirmed not to be the full rosters. There are still units tucked up CA sleeves, and apart from that, the Cornate units have had their HP reduced significantly for the purpose of this battle. So, don't use that to gauge how deadly they might actually be. The battle is also set on easy mode, if you're considering the leadership numbers and that aside, numbers are anyway always still up for balancing in this stage of development, so expect the numbers to change, but the overall sort of themes and overall makeup of the rosters and each individual unit will probably be relatively similar and sort of constant between now and release. With that said, let's begin with Zarina Katarin, the Ice Queen of Kislev and its current ruler clearly set as the faction leader. She's an absolutely devastating spellcaster and we'll touch on the lore of ice later in this video to show exactly what I mean by that. But Purely based on stats, you can see she's a decent melee combatant too. Frostbite in melee along with magical damage output with decent melee attack and defense and weapon strength to boot. Her armor is low, but that's negated by her ward save of 10% and missile resistance of 15%. Her item, the Crystal Cloak, presumably a quest item, grants a 22% physical resistance as well, but only when casting. And she can use the Crystal Sanctuary Augment to get a 66% damage resistance for herself or allies when they're in a predicament, though it does come at the cost of mobility. So she's not really meant to stay in melee, but she can hold her own for a bit until help arrives, as long as it arrives quickly, and she does have the tools needed to pull away safely, using Frostbite, for example, to potentially slow chasing enemies. Frostfang is a bound ability explosive spell causing damage and armor piercing damage in an area. She also has all her lore of ice spells and the lore attribute too, but like I said earlier, we'll touch on the lore of ice later in this very same video. She also has wounds, a passive you'll see across quite a few units that reduces their fighting capabilities when health drops below a certain threshold. In this case, 50% of the base HP and I believe 50% is a constant number every time you see wounds. This seems to be something applied specifically to single entity units, and it really helps reduce their impact when they've taken a bit of damage. I quite like the idea here, and I'm curious to see exactly how it feels when applied across the board. It's a great representation of a wounded warrior fighting worse, and it makes them a little bit easier to catch and eliminate, which is an interesting idea, and it's very kind of daunting and it adds some stakes I suppose as you know you do things like dive into the realm of chaos I suppose. By our blood however is a passive that you'll see across all Kislevite units and it helps when the unit is under that very same HP threshold in fact uh, adding a leadership buff and like I said earlier you'll see this across all Kislevite units it is their faction unique battlefield mechanic at least that's what I'm taking away over here. The Patriarch is a hero with great stats all around, though a little low on melee defense. Note that these stats are when he's mounted on his war bear, and he is at level 1. Uh, so I expect the armor and speed especially here will change, and perhaps the armor piercing goes away when he's off the bear as well. But since he's at level 1 and already on the bear, I wonder if uh, if the Patriarch is always on a bear, and, and you can't ever get him just on foot. Again, it's a 
demo event build, so a lot of custom stuff will be happening. Can't really draw any conclusions from that. Either way, his battle prayers make him a great support asset. With Salyak's lullaby used to heal injured troops and Urson's roar significantly buffing charge bonus and giving a slight increase to leadership as well. He causes fear, but be warned, he does suffer from wounds when injured beyond a threshold too. The Tsar Guard are a tier 3 sword and board infantry unit with silver tier shields and a pretty solid ability to hold the line with their melee defense where it is, despite a middling melee attack. The weapon damage includes 10 armor piercing damage and their leadership is through the roof with By Our Blood helping them hold the line when heavy losses have been inflicted. The Kossars are a tier 1 bow and axe hybrid unit claiming to be decent melee combatants but we all know how that works with 26 melee defense and 28 attack. They would regularly have a bit of armor but a status effect has them with a negative 15 debuff. But their leadership is quite good too. Keep in mind the buff from having encouraging troops nearby and the easy difficulty but still for a tier 1 unit, not bad. Plus. They, again, of course, also have by our blood for when the going gets tough and half their HP has been drained. Whether in range or in melee, their weapon damage does minimal armor piercing. The Kossars with spears are a variant of the Kossars with anti-large capabilities. Again, not excellent at melee, but this at least gives them charge defense when they're braced, and the anti-large bonus of 15 is nothing to scoff at against especially weaker large units. They'll be able to hold their own against some harassment units, for example. The Streltsy are a very fun tier 2 gun great axe hybrid unit, once again presenting themselves as decent melee combatants, and with their armor piercing melee and ranged capabilities, they're not half bad at whittling an enemy unit down and then finishing it off in melee. Good range, good leadership, good armor. Can't complain. The Ice Guard clearly come as variants, and this is their Glaive variant, with great leadership, immunity to psychology, and middling at best melee stats, but great range and missile damage in the delivery of Frostbite to slow enemies down. They are armor-piercing and anti-large in melee as well, so they can definitely hold their own against some would-be harassers, and in a pinch they can be used against some deadlier units as well. The Winged Lancer is Tier 2 Shock Cavalry with bronze shields on top of a significant amount of armor that is currently being reduced by 15 due to a status effect, so it's actually 80. They move with great speed and have a great charge bonus, but as is the case with Shock Cavalry, the melee attack and defense themselves are quite low, which means you want to use these guys for cycle charging and hit and run tactics. They cause fear, which means they're resistant to it themselves, and they also have by our blood, of course. Oh, shouldn't have to keep mentioning that, really. Overall, they'll do very well to poke a hole in enemy lines. The Griffin Legion are tier 3 shock cavalry with bronze tier shields, a great deal of armor, great speed, and a significant charge bonus. Their staying power in melee is low due to the middling melee stats in general, but a good charge will do a ridiculous amount of work, especially with their ability to cause fear as well. A nice rear charge, getting those flanking debuffs to enemy leadership, causing that fear, a very powerful tool, a very powerful tool. But on the topic of powerful tools, the War Bear Riders ride War Bears into battle, causing fear and charging in with significant armor, great speed and leadership, and overall decent melee stats with anti-large and armor-piercing capabilities to boot. The creatively named Horse Archers are a tier 2 ranged cavalry unit that is able to fire while moving and is able to keep its distance relatively easily with its extremely high speed. Able to vanguard deploy as well, these guys will be good at harassing the enemy throughout a battle, and with some of the spells we'll be talking about later, their survivability gets a great bump. Little Grom is a very capable unit as a tier 3 piece of artillery with decent melee capabilities considering its designation. It suffers from wounds, so you want to make sure it never gets too badly hurt so it can maintain efficiency, but it's armor piercing in range and in melee, and anti-infantry in melee too. This will hold its own for at least some time should it get swarmed in melee. I think the bears probably have something to do with that. Last of the Kislevite units today, the Elemental Bear. Great armor on top of 25% physical resistance, unbreakable, able to cause fear and terror, 
good melee attack with poor melee defense and massive amounts of weapon strength. This bear is quite the beast. It does suffer from wounds, so weakening it will be a priority for the enemy, since this thing will never leave the battlefield unless killed. It has a bound ability in its magic missile that does a fair bit of damage as well, and overall it's just a joy to watch in action because uh, it's a giant its a giant bear made of ice. I, I can't complain. It's pretty cool. Moving on to the other side of the battlefield, we're going to kick things off with the Blood Letters of Korn, a tier 2 infantry unit with armor-piercing anti-infantry greatswords causing magical damage. An armor-piercing value of 23 and a bonus versus infantry of 9 are great, but keep in mind their rather low melee defense and their only middling melee attack. With that said, Hellblade, which we'll see often among Cornet units who wield a Hellblade, uh, will increase their weapon base and armor-piercing damage by 20% each after the unit has got more than 80 kills. Banished and Demonic Instability will be a common sight among units with the Demonic trait, and they're just representations of how these demonic units actually die, or a part of how they die. When leadership crosses certain thresholds, a demonic unit will become unstable, and eventually it will be banished. Think of it like undead, crumbling, and then disintegration. They're just alternative words. The demonic trait itself is actually a collection of notes, letting you know that these guys are immune to terror, they have physical resistance, they don't rout, and they crumble on low leadership and eventually disintegrate like I was saying earlier. Their magic resistance, or spell resistance, is set at 25%, and if I'm not mistaken, you'll see this across all Cornate demons, perhaps all units in fact. It's a representation of Corn's uh, sort of opinion on magic as it were. Meanwhile, their physical resistance that I mentioned earlier is a solid 20%, which makes up for that lacking armor and, you know, sort of lowish melee defense as well. The Exalted Bloodletters of Corn are a tier 3 variant of the Bloodletters, better in every way when compared to the regular Bloodletters, though they have the same speed. The Chaos Warriors of Corn are a tier 2 axe infantry unit carrying silver tier shields with a tremendous amount of armor, solid leadership, and good melee stats across the board. They have Frenzy, they're immune to Psychology, and they're proof that the Chaos Armies will be a blend of mortal and demonic soldiers, since you can see these guys lack things like you know, demonic instability, for example. The naming convention over here also implies that each of the Chaos Demons will have their own variants. So here we have the Chaos Warriors of Korn, elsewhere we'll have the Chaos Warriors of Nurgle, the Chaos Warriors of Slanesh, Zinch, etc, etc. It was not entirely confirmed, but that's the vibe I'm getting from this naming convention. Now, the Chaos Warriors of Korn also come as a Halberd variant with the appropriate tweaks to their stats, a removal of their silver tier shields, a bonus versus large of 19, and an armor piercing of 24 on their weapon strength. And another variant of the Chaos Warrior of Korn, this time with dual weapons to make them anti-infantry, and with improvements to melee attack, charge bonus, and weapon strength, with a slight cost to melee defense, and the removal of the shields, lacking any armor piercing capabilities, but making up for it with sheer style. Again, mortals, so none of that demonic stuff over here. Chaos Warhounds are Chaos Warhounds, super fast mortal harassment units with relatively poor stats apart from their speed, with utility nonetheless. Use them to chase down enemy horse archers or to circle around front lines and get the occasional rear charge or bother the back lines otherwise. I mean, we're familiar with Chaos Warhounds and Warhound units in general, not much to say here. Chaos Furies of Corn being on the field implies that, as predicted, the Furies will come in God-specific flavors. These ones in particular probably derive that spell resistance from their Cornate ways, but apart from that, they have Frenzy and all the aforementioned trappings of being demonic. They can Vanguard deploy, are tremendously quick, and actually have a decent melee attack stat with magic damage and a decent weapon strength too, but their armor is around 15, reduced here by status effects and their melee defense is low too. But then again, don't forget that physical resistance of 20%. That does help tremendously, which is why we're seeing kind of low armor and melee defense stats it's to balance all that out. Blood Crushers of Korn are devastating melee cavalry with great armor and leadership alongside decent melee stats and charge bonus, causing magical damage with anti-infantry and armor piercing bonuses. The armor piercing of 42 is no joke, and the bonus versus infantry of 18 can be devastating. You can see, once more, Hellblade, as well as all the demonic standards, instability, banished, and the physical resistance of 20%. They also have the spell resistance of 25%, and they cause fear as well, as 
as you might imagine. The Skull Cannon is making an appearance as a Tier 3 war machine, able to fire at a very high range, causing 352 armor-piercing damage from range, along with 6 explosive damage and 14 armor-piercing explosive damage, but it's also able to cause anti-infantry armor-piercing damage in melee, with a bonus versus infantry of 24 and 62 armor-piercing damage. It causes magical and fire damage, and if I say the word damage one more time, it's going to start losing all meaning. And though the unit does have low melee defense, do keep in mind its armor of 110 on top of that 20% physical resistance, which I think more than balances it out. Middling melee attack stats and charge bonus, but decent in its speed, it causes fear, has spell resistance of 25%, can fire while moving, has all the trappings of being demonic, and also suffers from wounds. Its passive Gore Feast ability, however, does keep it regenerating health, while Skull Feast keeps it regenerating ammunition. This thing can keep going for a while if it doesn't get shut down early. The Bloodthirster is an absolute beast, able to fly and descend down into melee with some great melee stats, including a weapon damage of about 260 or so at least. It's been reduced here due to status effects. You can see it has all the trappings of a demonic entity, of course, meaning low leadership will cause it to perish, but also has the physical resistance that we've seen across demons. Causing fear and terror, but suffering from wounds when below an HP threshold, the Bloodthirster is a difficult thing to fight in melee, but it can be defeated with the right tools, especially when it's flying and you have a bunch of ranged units. The Blood Reaper looks like a hero character named as he is, and you can see him here atop his mount. Fire and magic damage with anti-infantry and armor-piercing capabilities on the massive weapon strength, you're looking at amazing armor on top of the 20% physical resistance from being demonic, solid leadership, great melee attack and charge bonuses, though with middling melee defense. Again though, don't forget the armor and physical resistance combination here, helping kind of balance out that middling melee defense. He's got the Hellblade, and again, of course, all the usual demonic trappings, and it's important to note that these stats are supposedly level 1 stats, so chances are he, you know, always comes in on a mount, chances are he, you know, starts at these stats and they can go a lot higher, but do remember this is a specific build for a specific event, so these things can change. It could just be for the purposes of showing off some units and mounts and things like that. They've been set up this way, so take it all with a grain of salt. Maybe like a handful of salt, actually. Like a Carthage worth of salt, perhaps. And finally, for the Cornate units, the Exalted Bloodthirster, coming in as a hero character. I don't recognize this name, but if you do, please let me know, because that would imply he's a legendary hero. But instead, I think we're just seeing a regular hero ranked up to level 10. So again, keep in mind as you look at these stats, He's a level 10 character, because my god, they're amazing. Even when reduced by status effects on the map, they're amazing. As far as abilities are concerned, Bellow of Fury is a bound magic missile, Deathbringer massively buffs base and armor-piercing weapon damage, and Bloodthirst gives huge boosts to speed, charge speed, and charge bonus. In the battle we played, the Cornate units were made a little softer for those less familiar with the game, and despite that, this guy took a concentrated effort to take down. What's cool to see is the weapon combination here as well. I mentioned in my speculation video the possibility of variants, and that's still up in the air. Might we see weapon choices as a part of ranking up Exalted Bloodthirsters, making them better at specific tasks versus another? Time will tell. Now to cool us off, let's switch gears for a little bit to the new lore of magic, the lore of ice. You can see everything we'll be talking about right on screen over here, and again, There'll be timestamps below to help you flip between the various topics, but there isn't too much to talk about, really. With HP balance all over the place, it's hard to make judgment calls, but I do want to say I quite like the lore of ice. It's got a spread of augments, hexes, and direct damage, a breath spell, and a decent lore attribute, too. Frost Shield buffs armor and missile block chances for all units across the battlefield when casting. As far as a lore attribute is concerned, getting a bump to defensive capabilities for a handful of seconds like that whenever your dedicated spellcaster lord is casting a spell is not a bad idea. Crystal Sanctuary gives a whopping 66% damage resistance at the cost of mobility, and this can be great in a pinch, especially if units are already locked in battle and it just needs that extra edge. Frostblades gives a flat buff to melee attack stats with percentage buffs to base weapon damage and armor piercing damage as well. They're not in significant numbers, and they can be used to counter debuffs or just to stack damage output to a great degree. 
The Ice Maiden's Kiss is a breath spell, which I'm not going to lie to you, I didn't even bother using, but it's good to have a different sort of a spell in here. I like, I like me some wind spells. I'd like a wind spell, please. Breath spells, they can be useful. Wind spells just look fantastic, though. Death Frost does a decent bit of direct damage, but we can't know the details until we look at the game files. Like, is it best used against, you know, fewer entities, or is it best used against a unit with lots of entities? So the assessment over here will have to wait. But Ice Sheet is a great hex that significantly slows the enemy down and drops their charge speed as well. A near 50% reduction to both means units can get into position or flee used offensively or defensively. It can be used to prevent an enemy from escaping as well when you have the upper hand. Heart of Winter is by far the most interesting spell, and it also is likely to get nerfed at least a little bit. Though again, I, it's way too early to tell this kind of stuff, folks. Don't be looking at balance right now. Now is not the time for, for, for a balance conversation. The Cornate units were in with reduced HP. We have this very clearly OP spell. So just keep that in mind. But, but despite those caveats, Heart of Winter absolutely melts entire clusters of enemy units, working over half a minute in four eight seconds increments, dealing damage and slowing the units in the area down. Given the propensity of the AI to clump up at times, the spell works wonders against the AI, but might be a bit more challenging to get mileage against human players. You can see how units just melt away within seconds. Though again, there's a lot going on here that can make it seem too powerful. I just thought it was kind of funny. This was basically the uh, win the battle spell. Despite its long cooldown, it, yeah, a little powerful. But again, too early to talk about balance. But that just about does it for the look at the rosters, lords, abilities, and spells. Linked in the description and pinned comment is the rest of this Total War Warhammer 3 playlist, so make sure to check it out for a look at the new battle modes being revealed, the showcase of the battle itself eventually, and more. Now, if you enjoy this video, don't hesitate to leave a like below, and for more Total War Warhammer 3 coverage, make sure you subscribe to the channel as well. If you'd like to pick the game up for yourself, you can find a link to my store in the description and pinned comment down below. Buying it there helps support the channel. As always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. That'll keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.